Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 386 for Monday, June 12th, 2023. <music> Greetings, folks. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include HelloFresh.com slash GigGab16, where you can go to use code GigGab16 and get 16 free meals plus free shipping, and CapoApp.com from Super Mega Ultra Groovy. That is the app that gives us song learning superpowers. I can give them to you, too. We'll talk more in depth about all of that in a little bit. For now, here in... Uh, w- w- weirdly like smoky, but not too terrible Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton here in Napomo, California. It's Paul Kent. How, uh, how goes my friend? It goes, it goes good. There's so much music going on. It's we're getting to the full summer swing here. And I gotta say, I feel, I feel very rich. You know, I, I think if you listen to this show, I kind of wear my heart on my sleeve pretty often. And there's times where I'm a little, you know, frustrated or down or, you know, or overly elated or something like that. Sure. Right now, I'm just really, I had an amazing solo gig yesterday. I had two fabulous uh, gigs with my band down here. Previous to that, last weekend, I had a fantastic gig, both with my big band, the House Rockers up in the Bay Area, and my combo band. So it was just so much music. And it's all just flowing, and everybody's well-rehearsed. And, the, you know, it's just, you just strap on the guitar and go. And it's just really nice feeling. That's gr- that, that is, that's wonderful. That's outstanding. <laughs> yeah. Any, any, uh, any specific highlights to call out or, or from the, from the recent Well, gigs? there's a couple of things. Yeah. I mean, especially with that band up in the Bay area, the combo group, the co- not the house rockers, but the, the combo got it. Yep. Yeah. Um, we're trying to, we're trying to uh, attack some more subtle, harder stuff. So we're playing, well, we're playing Mexico by, by James Taylor, oh, yeah. which a, you know, songs that are led by finger picking guitar, you know, just, it has to cut through the mix. And, you know, there's just a whole bunch of nuance to it that is good. And then it's just kind of this kind of Calypso beat to it, you know, that is yeah. just a different sound than you often hear. And then there's some cool harmonies to it. And so, it's just really, it's just really cool. That's awesome. That's a tough tune. So it's yeah. that type of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And and that's the thing is like I'm playing with really good guys who know their stuff, learn their stuff, and it's just you know it, there's there's just not much grinding going on, and, and um, yeah, I mean it's just life is is just musically fulfilling right now just because it's not. It's not like struggling to get gigs. Yep. It's not like struggling to keep a band on the same page to show up and do the gigs <laughs> and be happy while doing it. Yes. Yes. Right. Which is another. Yeah. We've thing, talked. Right. You yep, know. We've been through this. I too. know you can get the job. Can you do the job? Can you right? do this? It's and, the, uh, yeah. It's the. Uh, it's the rental car. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And and it's <laughs> yeah. Everybody. Everybody seems to want more. And then, you know, whereas I used to do a hundred or some odd solo gigs a year, I do a lot less now. Mm. And they're super fulfilling. I mean, they're just really. So you're not just grinding the them out. Where, you're, you're enjoying each of them. Yeah, I mean, I think I always kind of enjoyed them. Sure, but now they're sure. special because I'm doing so much less of them. Yeah, that, that's kind of what I. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. You crystallized that thought. That's awesome, man. Yeah, yeah, that's great. We had um, Bitter Pill played on Saturday night at the uh, Portsmouth Music Hall Lounge, and I we played there last July, and we now have had two really special experiences. I, I know I talked about it last year. This is the room where it really turned into a listening vibe last year where we had people, we, we actually saw people shushing each other if they were talking while we were mm. playing. I don't think that quite happened on Saturday. It was a different vibe. It was a little rowdier, uh, but not terrible. Like it was still very much a listening vibe. I just didn't see, see anybody shushing each other. Uh, but it was, it was, um, yeah, the band played well. We had a nice, you know, we had a nice setup and sound check and then just had some time to sort of kill between, you know, sound check and playing. And everybody was just 
so chill and happy. And we were, there was a lot of like laughter backstage. And then we just took the stage and, and it sort of spilled over into that. There was, uh, I was going to say there was one moment. There's one moment I'll talk about. There were many, many great moments that uh, I will continue to process from this gig, but there was one we're playing uh, this tune. It's this cover, this Tom Waits song and uh, called get behind the mule. And our guitar player took a solo where he always does. And it, the band got pretty, you know, energized behind him. And then I realized our singer, Emily, had started singing the third verse. And it was like, oh, okay, crap. Like, we now need to come down and, uh, like, you know, and, and match. Like, it, it needs the, the energy needs to drop out fast, right? You, you know, like, we need to be there with her. And, uh, and I, I, this is a band of people who th- together and separately have all done. Uh, lots of uh, musical theater and understand the a lot of the theatrical elements that are sort of necessary for performance right and so all i did was uh she sang the first line and while we were kind of in raucous mode and then you know on the downbeat of where she would start the second line i just i did a fill that just stopped the band and and we stopped and let her sing the line by herself and that was all it took to kind of, you know, suck the air out of it. And then we came back in, you know, much, much lower, sort of more appropriate energy and volume level kind of underneath the uh, mm. underneath the vocal. And it was a perfect moment. It was completely unrehearsed, of course, but it was such a, and I didn't even, like, I didn't even have time to think like, oh, is the band going to follow me on this or what should I do? It was, it was more instinct than anything else. You know, it was like, I, I knew what needed to happen. And so I just did it. And the nice part was. I, I didn't worry and it worked, you know, the, the, everybody in the band knew exactly what was happening. They, you know, at some level, we all understood exactly why that needed to happen. And it was just a really nice moment of like, you know, being in a band with, with, with theatrical people um, and, and people who understand that live music is a performance art, uh, you know, and understanding the, the value of dynamics and all of that stuff was like, Oh yeah, this is, it was a, this is a nice little, you know, it was like, oh yeah, yep, we're all on the same page. Nobody, nobody played through it. Everybody was right there. It was like, yep. Yeah. I mean, it's not the most complex thing in the world, obviously. Like, you know, you hear the drummer do a fill. It's like, all right, better. You know, like, it's clear what's happening as long as you're paying attention, right? As long as everybody's listening to everybody else, and uh, and everybody was. So it was, yeah, you know, it was just one of those one of those nice moments of of band and synchronicity. That band is actually is one of the more eclectic groups of personalities that you've played with, right? I That's mean, it's a, got a pretty yeah. wide range in ages and, you know, backgrounds and that type of thing, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it is It is diverse in that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm really fascinated. So tell me again. So this started out because of connections to theater stuff, which then turned into being a rock band, right? Or, you know, whatever you... Yeah, we should... Genre, you kind of, you're kind of genre bending, right? But We, um, we are, yeah. It... it I, it would be interesting. I'll share my perspective of it, but it would be really interesting to have Billy. We've mentioned having Billy on the show and we never have. It would, he would be a good person to have on the show for a variety of reasons. And and so hearing his take on this would be uh, probably valuable even for me. But uh, although I'm sure I've heard bits and pieces of it. But yeah, the the first project that was called Bitter Pill was a uh, theater show that happened in Portsmouth seven years ago. I want to say it might be six, something like that. Uh, it was after we had started doing this show and, and I remember talking about it on here, but it was, it was the same songs every night. It was a, it, it, kind of a trunk show in a, in the sense of where it was just songs from Billy's catalog that were then sort of realized in a, a, a physical and visual sense with actors and uh, dancers and things like that. So there was a loose storyline if you wanted to follow one, but otherwise you could just enjoy sort of these. Would Billy his- self-produce this, you know, it was kind of his vision and his, yeah, and his art and he kind of self-produced this, uh, this event. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, you know, he, he worked, well, I mean, he, he is a, he's he's got great ideas but he is a consummate collaborator he really likes to sort of engage and inv- and involve everybody around him uh, you know sometimes he's like no i want to do it this way but but by and large it's you know it's a collaboration and so there were some other people there was a director and that thing in a sense 
split off and became sort of the core of that. It was, it was the inspiration for the, all those Madhouse shows that I wound up doing afterwards. Right. Um, but, but they were all cover songs, whereas Bitter Pill, the show was a, was original music. You know, it was, it was all of Billy's music and, and we all came together and it was, it was fantastic. I mean, it, it, not only was it fun to do, people loved it. Every show that we did sold out. It just grew bigger and bigger while we were doing it. And it was, it was fantastic. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was his vision, but he always said, even from like the first rehearsal, he's like, I want this, even though it's not just musicians here, you know, we've, we've also got dancers and actors and all of that. I want this to be like a band in that collaborative sense. Like we're, we're all just doing this thing together, like a band on, you know, a band would be on stage or whatever. We were a band on stage. We were just different than most rock bands that you would see. But it was a a band show. And the, the collaborative vibe was very much that of a band. I'm not sure everybody involved knew how to interpret that because many of them had never, like I'd been in bands, so I knew what that meant. You, you know what I mean? I, I but And you know what that means and many of our listeners do, but... But there were some people involved that didn't quite grok that and kind of had to come around to the, the the thinking of it. Like, no, no, it's safe. Like, we're we're just a band. We're not. This isn't a theater show. This is a band putting on a performance. And yes, there's you know songs to sing and and things to do. But we're all sort of collaborating together on it. And that was what he always said. And um, and then he wound up doing another show, uh, his own interpretation of Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus which involved a, a, a slight, I was not involved in that, uh, but, but it involved an acoustic, you know, it was just basically like um, banjo and guitar. And that's where Billy, I'm pretty sure that's where Billy first played the cello. Billy played piano for the, um, for the, the original bitter pill show. And then he, uh, and he's a fantastic piano player that that's his, you know, I, I would say that's his primary instrument. I don't know what he would say, mm. but um but in terms of you know his ability to play, like he's a freaking great piano player, it's awesome. But um, but then he started playing cello as a bass for Titus Andronicus, and that that's really where sort of the visual and even sort of eclectic musical representation of the current form of Bitter Pill probably is. You would see more of it in that than you would if you just looked at the four piece rock band that was the the backing band for the original or the the band for the original bitter pill show it's a cool story i mean yeah I think and his daughter like was so in that people. his daughter was in both productions actually so yeah and right. and is in the band as well so yeah, yeah i mean it, we've talked about how a lot of people throw an ad on craigslist and we'll just take the first you know qualified ish person they can in the interest of getting their feet going and move, and having a band yeah and and then you know as your network grows you have few more options i think um you know your network is bigger and you have a, you can spread the yeah. word and find out who's looking for something yeah you, you get and that's kind of more different. choice maybe yeah right yep or more informed you know, you choices this. i should say yeah 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 but you did this with the clam bake like you you walked into a you know a situation you were you weren't looking for a jam bandy thing right you were just looking for a band I was looking for a band. Uh, in fact, I wasn't even, I was looking cause I, we had just gotten to Austin. Uh, I mean, we hadn't been to Austin a month. Uh, so Lisa and I moved to Austin in 2019, sorry, 1995. We had never lived together before. We didn't really have jobs. Um, and, uh, we rented a house down there and, you know, then we're, we're like kind of, you know, trying to start our lives together. And, uh, we were out to dinner waiting for a table one night and I was, you know, looking for a band to play with. Cause I, that was part of what I wanted to do while I was down there, obviously. And she just had tears in her eyes and handed me the copy of the local, like entertainment rag, the Austin Chronicle. Mm. No, uh, Austin. Yeah. It was the Chronicle that, that she was reading. It was like this weekly thing that came out that had like listings for bands and artists and just all the weird, you know, stuff like artsy stuff that, that, uh, you would find in, in the town. She had tears in her eyes and she handed it to me. I'm like, what's wrong? And she's like, you got to read this ad. And it was, you know, hypnotic clam bake looking for a drummer auditions happening, you know, sometime next week, whatever it was, call this number, email this person, whatever it was, you know, contact us. And she's like, you got to do this. And I'm like, well, it's kind of crazy. We just moved here. She's like, yeah, but 
you don't have anything tying you down. You don't have a career right now. You don't have, you know, we don't have kids or there's nothing, you know, it was, she's like, when are you going to get this opportunity? You got to do it. I'm like, well, I don't even know if I'll pass. Did you know how long the commitment to tour was? I think I did. I think I knew, I think it was somewhat clear that it was for like their fall tour kind of thing. Um, and so like, yeah, there was, so I don't, I didn't save the ad. Like, I, I, you know, it would have been an interesting thing to look at today, but, um, I can't save all the crap that I've seen in my life. Like, <laughs> uh, and, and, and it was long before, like, you know, smartphones and clouds and stuff. So it'd be like, Oh, let me just look, you know, it's April of 1995. I'm sure I'll find it. I won't find it. Um, but yeah, there was some indication that this was a, for better or for worse, a fixed length sort of, you know, gig where they were looking for somebody. And I was like, yeah, no, this is crazy. Like, I don't even know if I'd pass the audition. She's like, when have you ever failed an audition? And, uh, at, at that point in my life, I, I never had, I have since then. Um, but at that point I really never had, which meant I wasn't taking enough chances. And so it was like, all right, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, this would be amazing. She's like, you, you know, you need to know what it's like to be on tour. And I'm like, yeah, yeah well, okay. Uh, yeah. Like I was, I was petrified of this and I was, I was like petrified about it. Even after I got the gig, I was petrified right down to like a week before I went, I was like, I don't know if I should do this. This is crazy. I was, I was out to lunch with a guy who you might know. A guy named Mike Rosenfeld. He was the marketing director mm -hmm. for a company called Power Computing in Austin. Sure, right. I know Mike well. Okay, so I was out to lunch with Mike. Knew Mike well. Yeah, yeah. And he said, uh, "Why is, did Mike pass away or something?" No, no, no. You, I just oh, haven't talked you just to haven't been in touch with him. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I haven't yeah. been in touch with him either. But uh, I was out to lunch with him a week or two before I went. Like it was like if I was going to, you know, pull the rug out from under this thing, it was time to tell the band, like, "Hey, it's I'm not going to be there. You need to find somebody else." You know. And, uh, and we were having lunch and I was telling him and he, he was, I don't know if he was a musician or not, but he was into it, you know, and, and we had had lunch a couple of times. He knew this thing was kind of coming up for me. And, uh, he's like, all right, well, do you trust me? And I'm like, um, I guess sure. You know, Mike was a consummate salesman. Like he was like the master at, at selling anything. And he's like, well, if you trust me, I have an exercise. And I'm like, okay. And he pulls out a quarter and he's like, Heads you go, tails you stay home. You in on this? And I'm like, yep, I'm in. And he flipped it and it was heads. And it was like, you're going. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> ever, did you ever look at both sides of that coin? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Hadn't thought about it until this Cons very moment, Remember Paul. Remember the consummate salesman part of that. <laughs> <laughs> I was young. I was, you know, what, 22 or something, 24 maybe. Yeah, yeah, because I turned, I would have turned... I would have turned 24 on that tour. So I was 23. Yeah. 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 I, I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't quite skilled in the uh, ways of the consummate salespeople. <laughs> so I trusted that there were two sides, two different sides to that coin, but uh, yeah. Yeah. It was uh yeah. So I hadn't thought about that in a long time. I don't even know if Lisa knows that story. Um, mm. Yeah. She will now. She will now. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. When you joined that band, did you actually tell them we'll try it for one tour or, or like, how did you end it with that band? Mm. So that's, that's a very long story, but it, it was, it, it was the commitment from both sides was one was the fall tour. Oh. Um, it, there, there was during the tour, there was talk about potentially extending things with that same lineup because it was such a great lineup. I mean, it, all of us were like, oh my gosh, like this is a fantastic band. Everybody locks in well, everybody listens well. I mean, you know, we all, like I was gushing about Bitter Pill earlier, like that's how we all were gushing about each other, which was kind of weird having to live together too. Like there were moments where we did not, like it was, you know, it was friction because we were living on a bus. Um, mm. But, uh, and I, I'll probably share those stories more privately with you than because, because there's mm. these people are still out there playing music and it's, you know, we all have our, <laughs> they, no one did anything wrong. Um, well, dude, you know, but like we, Nick, but we pissed each other off. This, <laughs> well, this, this is the thing is so Nick, you know, put together that 14 piece Zappa band and, and he's making a business of it. I mean, they just did yeah. another tour, the Stinkford orchestra. They just did yeah. another tour of the Pacific Northwest He's all in. He actually bought a bus, tricked it out, you know, that they could all fit in there and their gear could fit in there. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, some and many can sleep in there. And you know, Nick's still financing the project largely. Okay. But I was just more thinking about what's it like to get a bunch of fifty plus year old guys on a bus for sixteen hours at a time, right? <laughs> like, like you know, when you're young and you know, a your body's a little bit more into it, so you get a little grouchy, less grouchy. Yeah. But what's it like to get a bunch of mature, you know, musicians traveling that close together? You know, and it's not a school bus bus. It's like, you know, like like the type of bus that takes you to the to the car rental, you know, depot oh. type thing, right? Oh, so he yeah. bought a nice bus. Oh, well, that size. I, yeah. I, don't know, I mean, I don't nice. know if it's I mean, nice. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So and I got, you know, like I say, they, you know, they've done three tours of the Northwest. They're about I'm going to see him play in a, in a couple of weeks down. He's coming through my town and then he's going to Los Angeles. And, you know, I just I give him all love and respect because he's sticking with it. Yeah. I have a plan. The whole band is invested and in they, you know, they market, they do all the type of stuff. This tour again, it seems like his vision of, uh, of you know, just every time you go, you pick up, you know, some more fans. And that well, that's how it works. Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, that, that I is. I know nothing about that world. Nothing about that world. But, I mean, it, as he's explained it to me, they're just, they're just working. And I'm, you know, I'm amazed he's gotten 14 seasoned musicians, many with day jobs, to figure out how to take, you know, three, four, five days off several times a year to go do a tour. And, but mostly the social part of it, like, like yep. again, you know what it was like at, at 20 to do this. Yeah. Could you do it at 50? Uh, I, yeah. I mean, with the right band, I don't know that I would. That's a really good question. I, I like bitter pill has talked about doing like a two week, you know, tour. Uh, and, and that I, I would do, uh, you know, it's, I mean, as long as we could like fit it into our respective schedules, but I think everybody would, do everything they could to carve that out and make it happen. If, if we were to do that. Uh, but in terms of the, the people, yeah, I, I would, but I know like it's a known quantity to me when I flew from Austin to Boston. I mean, remember I grew up near here, but I was not living near here and I didn't know any of the people in the band. I had met Maury, the, the leader of the band and he came to my house and we did the audition uh, but that was, that was it. And we, you know, we met each other for an hour or two. Like it wasn't, it was, you know, at most an afternoon, it wasn't like, we didn't know each other. And, yeah. uh, and it was just like, yeah, I'm just going to go and, and make it happen. And, and we did, it, it, it was fine, but that's would I do that today. I don't know, man. That's a really good question. Thankfully, no one has asked. And <laughs> so I don't need to actually answer that question, but I would, I would have a lot more questions about it going in. Um, there, there would be a, a, a more of a vetting process, I would think. And uh, I don't know, like that's a, it would, it, it would depend on a lot of things, but I would yeah. be far less likely to do it now than I did it at, you know, 23 or whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not 23 anymore. All right. It is almost summertime, and this summer, HelloFresh, our sponsor, is here to take the work out of eating well. Because with HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. You get to skip all those trips to the grocery store, and you can count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Lisa and I have been using HelloFresh a bunch lately, partially because we've been kind of going in and out of empty nesting mode here and it's been great to get out of that recipe rut, right? We get used to making certain things. We make them all the time. And nowadays we get to do different things. And HelloFresh helps us do that. They've got 40 recipes to choose from weekly and options to please even the pickiest eaters. There's always meals for everybody to enjoy. And speaking of enjoyment, for me, the enjoyment with HelloFresh starts before I even get to the table because they've got these foolproof instructions that make it really easy to truly collaborate on making dinner together, right? Usually, if we don't have a recipe like this, one of us is sort of in charge and the other person might be there. But, you know, it's really falls on one person to get the job done. With HelloFresh, we all just look at the recipe and when it's two of us or even four of us, we can divvy it up. We're all contributing. We're all having fun in the kitchen. And then we've got a meal that we made together. Plus, with HelloFresh, you get to spend less time meal planning and prepping because HelloFresh's pre-portioned ingredients make it easy to get cooking quickly. 
Go to HelloFresh.com slash GigGab16 and use code GigGab16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Again, that's HelloFresh.com slash GigGab16. That's G-I-G-G-A-B-1-6. And then use the same thing for the code GigGab16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. And you get to enjoy HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. And we'd like to thank them for sponsoring this episode. Next up is Capo from our friends at Super Mega Ultra Groovy. We've talked about Capo quite a bit on the show here, and it's true. It gives us song learning superpowers. You can start your playback at any point. You can loop it. You can slow it down. You can speed it up. One thing we keep mentioning is that Capo is completely free. No signups, no ads, no sneaky free trials. The developers are fine with you using Capo's core features for free. They're betting that you'll eventually fall in love and maybe you'll want to pay extra for even more features or that you'll tell you all your friends about this great free app and one of them might buy the extra features. They're in this for the long haul and I wanted to make sure you folks know that. you got to go check this out. It's so cool. It does all that I've described plus it lifts and detects and estimates chords. It detects beat locations. So much more. Visit capoapp.com or search for Capo, C-A-P-O, in the App Store. It works on the Mac, the iPhone, the iPad. Again, Capo by Super Mega Ultra Groovy. That's C-A-P-O-A-P-P dot com, CapoApp.com. And our thanks to the folks at Capo for sponsoring this episode. Hey, Paul, I have something to tell you. What? Uh, I'm going to be hairless for the summer. This sounds like too much information, but go ahead. <laughs> Uh, it's more related to iPads, uh, or at least iPads were the, uh, the, the straw that broke this particular camel's back. Uh, I was, I was invited to play drums for a production of hair this summer. And, uh, for, it's like a six weekend run or something with like six shows a weekend. So I was like, okay, well I like that doesn't fit into my life right now. Unlike when I was 23, I have, you know, like a few businesses to run. I've got a couple of bands I'm playing in, like, you know, all these things. I've got, you know, a family. And, uh, but I worked it out with uh, another drummer or two, actually, that we're going to take some of the shows. And then it was like, I was going to wind up doing like 10 of them or something. I was like, all right, this will be fun, whatever. And then, but it, then it was like, oh, I don't know if I can fit that in because I got more travel. I got a trade show I got to go to and this, that, and the other thing. And and then the the straw that broke the camel's back was when they said, uh, you know, we talk on this show about how we, we talked about Jay Segan saying no iPads on stage, right? Well, they said no iPads on stage, not that we couldn't have music on stage, mind you, it, but it needed to be sheet music, not a tablet. And I had decided long ago that I would never deal with that again on stage and then when I saw Natalie Merchant and her band, especially her drummer, fighting with sheet music for, you know, the two and a half hours they spent on stage, including at one point putting his sticks down to like turn three pages at once or whatever. Yeah, it was. A, yeah, I don't even know if I mentioned that on the show, but it was like, you know, PTSD. It was like, oh, man, I'm so glad I never have to do that again. And then the email came in and they were like, yeah, we're going to do this with uh, the, you know, the old school vibe or whatever, the sixties. And so the, there won't be iPads on stage. You just have to use, you know, the traditional sheet music. It was like, yep. All right. The universe has been trying to tell me I can't fit this show into my schedule. And now I finally hear it loud and clear. So I'll be here <laughs> this summer. Yeah. 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 It's uh, I'm curious. Clever, clever turn of phrase. Thank you. Uh, you know, I try, it's what I try to do, but um yeah, it was. Um, I didn't know which way that was going to go. I I know you didn't. I and that's why I didn't tell you in advance. I figured it would be better as a setup. Uh, so thank you for trusting me on that. Um, mm. Yeah, I, yeah. It's um, I I sort of get the vibe of it, but I don't know, man. Like everybody's going to be on in ears, so that certainly wasn't happening in the '60s. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It's it's fine. Like it, it, I I have an interesting question for you. Yeah, man. Who do you think listens to this show? Like if you were to generalize just from the emails that we've gotten over the years, draw, draw a picture of who you think listens to the show. So there's, there's at least two distinct groups of people that I will generalize all of you folks into, but I, I dislike having to generalize you. You're each individual people and I, I love it. But uh, there are people who are musicians 
um, and and we could probably segment. Uh, we certainly could segment that down even further. Uh, you, you know, active musicians currently playing, musicians who used to play that don't anymore, but like to hear this you know type of banter going on, and then musicians who haven't yet started playing out who want to. Right. So there's the musicians out there, and then right. uh, that's sort of one group and then the other group that i i know exists and there's probably more of you so let us know feedback at giggabpodcast.com but the other group that surprised me after we started this show are the music fans the people who are not musicians but love to go and see live music or in, and are interested in in music and want to kind of peek behind the curtain if you will and and hear these inane conversations about some hairless drummer or whatever <laughs> like you know uh, yeah. Um, so I know of those two I, groups, but I, I, am I missing yeah. anything? What, like, what do you think? No, well, I just think it's interesting to discuss and I hope, you know, some people weigh in because I think about yeah. all the nice emails we get and those are largely, I think those are largely band leader people, like people out scrounging up gigs, hustling up gigs, um, you know, who deal with the kind of social aspects. And this is, I get the sense it's the same thing that, that I get out of it, which is kind of this cathartic, you know, help group, you know, to, yeah. you're not alone in trying to do this, you know, usually rewarding, often frustrating task. And then I agree. The second part is the, is the inside baseball, you know, people who, you know, like you said, want a little peek under the kimono about how a music scene works or how, you know, local bands organize or do what they do. But I, I would actually, I asked the question because I don't think it's the average musician. I don't think it's the sideman musician. Is oh no, we have tons of, of those that email us. See, I would think it's more. I would think it's more. It's more band leaders. Like, is, are you? I who, think. If, like, I think there might be some confirmation bias going on here because uh, I like we definitely. <laughs> I, I forgive me for for presuming, but I know because I see the emails too. Right, like we both get them. I know that there are people that write in that are, you know, just sidemen. I say just like musicians that aren't running their bands. And then certainly there are people who write in who are musicians who are running their bands as well. But yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a mix of that, but tell me if I'm wrong. I mean, I don't know how you, I don't know how you folks out there would know. No, if I'm again, wrong. I just, I get yeah. a sense that the things that we talk about, you know, cause we will get into some gear and yeah. we get, but we largely, you know, we talk about, about the organization of, how a band gets to do what they love to do. Yeah. And yeah, you're right. I never thought about it that way, but there probably is a confirmation bias that I'm, I'm listening to and reading the in, into those emails, the people who are my kin here, you know, right. Yeah, exactly. uh, Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just interesting. I mean, you know, eight years of doing this, you know, hundreds of emails over the years and, and uh, you know, I got that nice email last week from that guy who uh, just sold out Daryl's place. Right. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was like, you know, yep. he was super, you know, complimentary that just the conversations just resonate with him. And uh, you know, he just sold out, you know, uh, Daryl Hall's, it's like, it's not called Daryl's place. What is it called? It's called Daryl's house in Pauling, New York. Yeah. This Darryl's was, house. was uh listener Scott and I will, uh, they're an original band out of Connecticut. Uh, written by Scott Smith, North County Band of Reading, Connecticut. So, yeah, super original too. Like, really, yeah. I'll, know, I'll put a I'll put a link. Band. I'll put a link to the uh, tune that he sent us right there. And uh, let's see, high stakes human game is the uh, is the song that that mm-hmm. he sent. So, yeah, yeah. No, we love getting your emails. I I have a question for everyone here. Uh, because I noticed something, especially in light of my recent decision to n- not take a theater gig in, at least in part, because I couldn't use my iPad to read the music. Um, as I was printing out the set list that I was going to use on Saturday night for the bitter pill gig. And I never want to have my set list on an iPad. I always want it on paper I want it to be visible at all times. I don't want to have to rely on electronics for, I don't like, this is a thing. And it it was, I was just sort of noticing it as I was, you know, doing, going through my routine of printing out the set list. It was like, oh yeah, no, I I don't want that on the screen because the screen, I might need something different on. I might need 
you know, the house mixer on it. And, you know, so I can adjust my ears or I might need a chart for a song that I, you know, have not internalized mm-hmm. yet or whatever. But the set list, I, I need to always be able to see. And it's it's not very long. So it makes perfect sense to just print it and put it on the floor and just have it there. So I'm I'm curious for you, Paul, but also everybody feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Which do you prefer? Do you have your set list on paper? Do you have a set list on a tablet? Do you do both? Um. When it's the house rockers, it's on um, paper on the floor because I have nothing on my mic stand. And when it's the acoustic gigs, I will use a tablet and it controls my, it's a mixer yep. and it's got a set list right there. And, you know, so it's just convenient to have that. And I'm not, I'm not you know, walking around with a microphone in that band. So sure. you know, I'm just holding yep. an acoustic guitar and playing in front of there. So yeah, yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. No, I, 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 I have done it where, for whatever reason, I wind up with the set list on my phone or my iPad and I, I, it like, it throws me off all night. I don't like it. Um, it's like, I don't know. I just, I like to be able to see it. I like to be able to think about, you know, what's going on and all that stuff. I still sure. screwed, I still screwed it up on Saturday night. Uh, I, I, we finished one song and I looked on the set list and this does happen occasionally to me. Saturday was not the first time and it will not be the last where I, you know, just mentally skipped over like a song and it was like, oh yeah, we finished that one. And now this is this one, the band looked at It's so it. weird. I do that as well. And, yeah. it, and the funny thing is you do it once and yeah. you make a note to yourself not to do it again. Uh-huh. And you stare at the set list and you're extra careful <laughs> and you can still do it again. I don't know what it is yep. that makes that happen. I think, you know, I, I don't know. The, the amount of things that I tell myself to remember in gigs, once you have to go to your head, oh, it's over. you're just hosed. It yeah, is. It's yeah, your hose. Yeah. I mean, again, it's 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 singing lyrics. It's you know, I have a list of things that I try to remember to do about thanking the audience, about thanking the sound crew, about thanking the people who hired us. Yeah. And and again, it's a ten piece band to introduce. So when we're doing the introductions and stuff, sometimes it just feels so freaking long. Do you introduce the whole to, band at once? Most nights I do. Okay. There are nights when I have to change the set list and the place where I would do that. Um goes out the window and then it becomes harder to do it. Cause I won't do it usually at a stop. Like when they're, it will usually do it in the middle of a song. Right. Like, like right. Sure. You know, but um, yeah, I mean, but the point of all of it is, is the stuff I tell myself to remember, I still have not all these years, all these gigs, I still have not figured the right way to just make it right. And, and, and I think the answer is it has to be the same every night. Right. I mean, if you just, if you just do it at the same part of the show. Oh yeah, sure. With the same list of things, you're less likely to screw it up. But, less yeah. likely to screw it less up. Likely. Yeah. <laughs> less likely. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I was at, uh, I was at the stone church on Friday night. Why was it at the stone church on Friday night? We were seeing, Oh, we we're seeing that band jazz is fish. That's right. And I was talking to Jamie, the owner and I, I said, oh, and you got your new soundboard. And she's like, yeah, they got a new Allen and Heath SQ6 that our friend Davis uh, was involved in like getting set up for him and all that good stuff, which is great. She's like, have you seen it yet? I'm like, no. She's like, you want to see it? I'm like, sure. So she introduced me to the engineer for the night and, and brought me up, you know, behind the soundboard and was showing me everything. And she's like, and, and then she blew my mind because I never thought about this. So they have the, the, what I'll call the main room for the music. There is an upstairs now, which sometimes has bands and, but also they do like comedians and stuff. And then during COVID, but now also since the lockdowns, they built a stage outside that they use all summer long for gigs outside, which is great. You know? Uh, and she said, yeah, she's like, so now we have 48 channels uh, in this mixer, 48 inputs. And she's like, I bought a couple of stage boxes with it, which means that this one mixer can mix three different shows simultaneously here. Mm. And it was like, of course it can. (laughs) I mean, why not? Right. As long as you have enough outputs to cover the mains and the monitors that you need for any given setup, like why, like everything doesn't have to go into every output. And I, you know, I joked with her. I'm like, you just got to make sure that whoever's running outside doesn't, you know, bring up a, a vocal mic from inside. Cause that's going to sound raw. You know what I mean? But uh, she's like, yeah, of course. But still, she's like, we've got it pretty segmented out that it's it's fairly easy to to sort of keep things separate. And I thought, what a great idea 
you don't need to go buy multiple mixers and she could buy a nicer mixer for, you know, single mixer that would cost her probably less than three mediocre mixers that she has to go and set up in, in three different places. Right. You know what I mean? It was just, no, like, I, I, I love creative use of gear like that. And when she told it to me, I was like, just like, She's like, I know this is kind of nerdy. I'm like, are you, we've met, right? Like I'm super nerdy about this stuff. I'm like, you've blown my mind here. I just never once thought of using a, you know, one mixer to do multiple things, but obviously you can, like, there's no, mm -hmm. you know, there's no reason. They created scenes for. They, yeah. Yeah. But this isn't even just scenes. I mean, it's, it's, it is, but it's just splitting it essentially in half or in thirds and just saying, okay, well. You know, these channels only send them to outputs four, five, and seven. Right. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. But yeah, you're right. Yeah, you save that to a scene and now it's pull it up and it's like, okay, good to go. Like everything's where it needs to be. You bring stage box A outside, you know, stage box B upstairs and and you grab an iPad and Bob's your uncle. You're good to go. So I, I just I loved uh, I love that idea. I'm sure I'll I'm sure there will be some scenario where you know, that, that comes back into my head where it's like, Hey, wait, wait, I know how to solve this problem. So yep. I don't know that I would have thought hey, about that on my own. Yeah. I have one more story to tell. Okay. Kind of interesting. Yeah. So there is a place <clears throat> that I play acoustic. It's a pretty nice place. It doesn't pay great. Okay. Tips have been pretty good enough to bring it up to respectable. Sure. Yep. The guy who books it is, um, he's pretty overextended. He's pretty busy. He's super hard to get a hold of. He books like six or seven venues in this way, right? Yeah. So he's an independent guy who, who basically goes into a venue and says, you know, I, I know all the musicians. I can get you stuff. Anyway, I've played it for a while and I've built up the relationship. And this is a story about relationships and and, you know, when you get to be a cranky old musician, like I feel like I am sometimes. So We, we so, all are. I, I was well, also a cranky well, young musician well, at times too, but you know. Cool. Uh oh. Paul? This is the deal about. Are oh, you yeah. there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something weird happened, but you're, we're, we're all good. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, you know, there is the business like attitude where you get the concept of leverage. You want the gig, he has the gig. You know, sometimes you feel like you've got to swallow things or you don't even look at it as swallowing. You just say that this is the deal here. This right. is the deal. Anyway. Right. This is the, right. This is how, what it takes to get this done. Yeah. So I took a gig at this place. It was a Friday night. Good night. And the place is indoor, outdoor. Right. Okay. And I get to the place and, and ask where they want me to set up indoors or outdoors. And they say, well, we have an event on the outdoor um, set up indoor. So I set up indoor and I don't know what happened. I don't know this part of it, but everyone that came in, they seated outdoor. I played to an almost empty room. That, that okay? sucks. Okay. And so I don't know why they told me there was an event there or what the deal was, but all right. You know, I, I was like, and you don't know it's going to be this way all night. So right, anyway, right. Yeah. it was a new kind of manager. And, and uh, as I was playing, uh, my daughter and some friends came to see me and I was checking with them. It was like, volume. Okay. And he was, you know, quite pleasant about it. And he, you know, I asked him two or three times and he said, if it wasn't, I'd let you know. It's cool. Right. But over the course of the night, I noticed that, that he's seating everybody outdoors. And, uh, and once my daughter and their party left, it was pretty much an empty room, but the patio outside was full, right? Three hour gig. And um, about two thirds of the way through the gig, he comes by and, he, and the manager says, you know, you should turn down because a lot of people are saying they want to be seated outside because it's too loud in here. Mm. And I was like, hmm. this, this is all feeling really, really weird to me. Anyway, I have never, never been stiffed on tips. I mean, I don't let my daughter and her friends tip me. So, so yeah, let's, yeah, yeah. So yeah, set That's that fair. aside, right? Sure. I have never, but literally it was an empty room while the large patio outside behind me was full, right? And, um, it was weird. So we'll pause the story there. So then I text the guy who hired me, who was who just, he's never there. Right. I see. Yeah. And sure. I was like, yeah. I was like, you know, so I don't know what happened, but two things. One, <clears throat> it was an empty room and he said, everybody outside. And I don't know what the deal was. He said there was a, there was a, a, an event that was supposed to be out there. 
But it was clear that everybody that was coming up asking for a table was going. As a, and then there was this whole, you know, checking of volume things that was fine until two thirds of the way through the gig. And then kind of a weird exchange, right? That's so, so weird. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, some they, they, like, I, I know that there are people out there befuddled by this story. And then I also know there are musicians out there who are nodding their heads like, yep. Sometimes you just can't win for losing. Like it seems like the universe is against you. Like we've, we've, well, many of us have been there. Right. Yeah. It's, but it doesn't mean but, we want to be there again. Yep. Right. So I texted the guy after the gig because he says text him and that's how he pays me. Okay. You know, Venmo's me. Sure. And um, he doesn't get back to me that night. The next day, oh, actually, I don't hear him from the next day. And I say, I send him another text, say, hey, can we talk about what happened? And I was being, I was like, you should want to know. What yep. the situation is at a venue that you book? Yes. I had a, a, a sense that he's a musician as well, right? Okay. And I, I haven't had a, a conflict with this guy, so I didn't know whether he would, you know, it's going to go two ways. Yeah. He's going to understand that if this gets around, musicians aren't, aren't going to want to play there, or he's going to want to defend his client who's paying him to book the bands. Right. Yep. It's one of those two things or somewhere in between, like those are the three doors you can go by. You can get a guy who says, no, 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 I take care of my musicians and let me figure out what was going on and let me talk to you. Sure. Or you can get a guy who can say, you know, well, sand. you know, yep. it's, it's their, it's their choice. If you don't take the gig, someone else will. Yeah. That's the, pl that's where he went. Right. Oh, wow. So he was like, you know, yeah, you know, they, they decide, I really don't have any control over where you set up. And that's all he wanted to talk about. And you don't want to talk about. And so I'm sitting there saying, listen, it's a nice place to play. It's cool in some ways, but I do not need this gig. You know, I, right. I literally, right. yeah. whatever. I, and I offered to talk about it civilly and the booking guy, let me know where he lives. He, he lives yeah. like, nope, the, 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 they're paying me. They're my client. I, which I get it. That's, that's the situation. And you know, you have the times in life where you decide how big, a, like I, I didn't make a Facebook post of this. I think I've shared sure. other times when people have been not cool where I've made a bigger deal of it. I haven't done that. This is, I don't, I don't know if anybody even who even knows me listening to this, if they might be able to figure out who I'm talking about, but it was, it was that thing. It was like a musician in, in an effort to try and, you know, make his living goes out and starts a booking business, says, I know, you know, all the good musicians, I can bring you the best people, right? Yeah. And you know, now it's, go ahead. No, I was going to, this reminds me, we had Paul Costley uh, on the show, I think it was sometime in 2020, right? In the middle of yeah. like COVID and all that. Paul is a musician around here in my mm -hmm. local area. He also started and at the time was running probably the largest booking agency just in terms of the number of bands and venues. Like there might be somebody who books a list bands who's making more than he was, but like he was making a, a fine living for himself and his family. And I think he had an employee or two uh, booking probably hundreds of venues with who knows how many bands, right? Like everybody around here wound up working with him. And he said as much when he was on the show, uh, right. but his whole thing, thing was I take care of my musicians. That's how I know that I will be able to go and book these venues. Yep. Uh, and it was like what you're describing is the yep. opposite of that. Exactly. Yep. And, and, and like Paul has since, I, I don't know the particulars, but, but his, he handed his business off to this guy, Dimitri, who was working for him for a while and, and now is sort of running things. Uh, I don't know the particulars. I don't know if he sold it or what, but you know, Paul is no longer Paul's out there playing gigs, but he is not the one uh, running the day to day, at least of um, not so costly entertainment, uh, which is a brilliant um, name for a guy <laughs> named Paul Costly. But uh, he was always about taking care of the musicians. Now I'm sure if a musician came to him with an unreasonable complaint or request or something, he would like, as nicely as Paul could tell him, come on, man, like, you know, like you, you, this is not realistic. Mm -hmm. You're not being reasonable, but I never saw that from him. He definitely wrote a hard line at times. Like, Nope, 
this is the deal at this venue. Like you got to show up then. And this is how is this going to work? And this is what the pay is. And of course you could say no. And if you said no too many times, then you weren't on his, uh, you know, rotation as, as high because he wanted low friction, but, but other, which makes sense, but he was always taking care of the musicians and making sure that scenarios like you described wouldn't happen. Like, especially if it's a gig where the tips are, essentially a, an expected part of the the overall you know revenue stack if you will of of the gig yeah mm-hmm. that's yeah it seems like this guy is uh, short-sighted he might want to listen to that yeah, episode yeah. With, with paul well i mean you know it's a game of leverage right and, yeah. and this is where i say musicians are often musicians worst enemy i mean we all we talk about hey it's a great music scene everybody's supportive all the time. it's i i Right here and right now, we'll say, I find it to be all BS, right? We've shared, I think I share with you, you know, that we played a club for many years and a club did us absolutely wrong. Yep. Yeah, they had no problem, you know, getting full bands for 300 bucks, you know, in one of the most, in one of the most expensive areas in the country, a place is playing bands 300 bucks and bands are taking it. Yep. And, you know, it's, it is the universal concept of leverage, right? It, do you that have it? That it is. Yep. Do you have it yeah. or, do they, or do they have it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it, it, we've said it many times on the show. It doesn't have to be that. There, there is a world and we've all experienced it, or at least if I certainly have. I know you have. I hope each of you out there has. And if you haven't, you will. So trust this. There are plenty of scenarios that are non-zero sum games. Like the the venue doesn't have to lose for you to win. And the opposite is also true, right? You can all win together uh, as long as everybody. The question is whether you have the energy to co- someone who doesn't intuitively get that. Yes. To coax them into that behavior. Yeah, that, do you wanna, that, I think that's a question. That's the question. And sometimes the answer is no. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I was hoping would be the conversation right. with this guy. Like, if you would have shown any empathy at all, I was like, oh, let me let me check into what happened there. I mean, you know, you've, you've even you've just for saying for a long that. time and, you know, you've you've made you've made them some money. They've made you some money. Let's figure out how we can get back to win win on this. That would change everything. Just the willingness to figure out what happened, but literally even, or even was- lying to you about it. Like I'm not, in, <laughs> I'm not encouraging this, but like even a, like a good sociopath knows that you tell someone I care about you, even if you don't, right? Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not defending this behavior, but I'm just stating it as a fact. Like, <clears throat> it, it, like it would have been really smart for that guy to say, Oh, I hear you. Let me take a look into this for you. And then he doesn't. And when you ask him about it, he says, yeah, I looked into it. There's nothing I can do. Right. Like, but it, well, it, at least here's then, the deal. Yeah. You can play that game with people who want to play that game. Sure. I mean, people who are, I don't know that you can coax people into that behavior, but no, you, you can try. Yeah. But I will say in my little black book of, 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 uh, of winners and losers, good deeds and bad deeds, angels and demons. I know where this guy is now, right? Yep. And there will come a place in a time where Such him and I will be in the same place. Yeah. Well, we, you know, they'll they'll come a place in time where him and I will be together, and uh, there'll be a conversation. And I actually think that the way a musician rests that leverage back is to play that I know that you know that I know what you did, right? Yeah. Well, like and, uh, yeah, a, a very, very wise friend of mine has often said on um, while I'm sitting in this very chair has said to me, when people tell you who you are, who they are, <laughs> believe them, believe them. Yep. Yeah. So that's uh, yeah. Yeah. I think I think this guy told you who he is. Absolutely. Without a doubt. You know, and I'm yep. really disappointed. I invested a fair amount in in, um, you know, playing his game You yeah. know, to get this gig. Which I wanted the gig, you know. It yeah. took a you know a lot of phone calls. I have I have friends who have wanted this gig, but they will not put up with the lack of you know return calls or the la- you know that type of thing. No, that that's an I interesting. No, that's an interesting thing where you you decide you want something, you you know a gig, whatever. But the gig is a fine example. You make some of those trade offs. You know, to like, well, I normally wouldn't do this, but I, I want this gig. So I'm going to like sort of take this scenario as it is and and make it and and I, I and believe that it will get better. And sometimes it does. Uh, you know, sometimes everything proves out and you're like, oh, yeah, you know, I del- I know that I can deliver for this. So I know after I play there the first time, everything we can settle it all in. And sometimes that works. Yeah. But sometimes 
you set yourself up in that, you know, the position of having no leverage and the other party simply leaves you there and has, like you said, no empathy for that scenario. And it's up to you to, to ripcord that and just walk yeah. away, which is obviously what you've done. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it is, and it stings, uh, for me anyway, when I make that decision and, and then get no, it's the lack of empathy back is really what it is. It's like, okay, wait a minute. Like we don't, this doesn't have to be a non-zero. Or it doesn't I say have it's the to lack be of as, decency back. Well, I, I mean, it's even, I mean, it's, it's even it's more than empathy. Yeah, if you're a booking guy, like yeah. like me as a business person, yeah. if you're a booking guy, your job is to figure out who will make your venues the most money. There, there's yes. there's a really good venue down here. Um, it's the probably the biggest venue down here in San Luis Obispo area. And um, I've called the booking guy and left a message to him about wanting to buy the place out and do a showcase for the house rockers down here. To get him done. He won't return that call. I'm offering him money and he won't return that call. Nick, when he tried to get his Zappa band book down here with a freaking member of Frank Zappa's band headlining the right, he cannot get a call back. And you know, the thing about this is it's weird. Your job as a booking person is to figure out. And he didn't, he didn't have, I didn't leave him a link to go look up. Nick didn't leave him a link. It was just a phone call saying, Can we talk about this? And then emails that don't go return. And I, I don't know. It, you I mean, know, if you're he, are they guy, just making hand, money hand it. over fist every night? And they don't, I don't think need? so. Okay. Cause I mean, I, there I, is, I, you know, here's the thing. I can't tell you why the behavior is so odd. It's, it just seems so obvious to me, you know, your job is to look into things to figure out what is the, the most optimal way to make my venue money night in and night out. That That's your job. Yes. Right. And, and uh, I, the only thing I can guess is there's a certain amount of hubris that, that, that goes to booking people that is like, I know I, I, you know, my taste is so good. Yeah. My spidey I know senses. What to put here. Yeah. Or, or, you know, like what I just dealt with at this one venue, it's like, I just got to get a warm body in there. And until the client tells me that the warm body wasn't good, I can take the path of least resistance and just keep getting this done. I can dole out favors to my friends. I can, you know, whatever, whatever yeah. that thing might be. Yep. But this would be a test of are you are you interested in doing the best thing for the venue that you're representing? And again, you can't color all bookers with the same cloth. No, but no, there's a lot of good ones out are, there. These like, are two. Of course, there are. Yeah. But these are two behaviors that you know. I'm going to bet anyone listening to this has encountered some flavor of both of these behaviors. Either, either total unexplainable lack of interest in having a conversation or stone cold. Well, if you don't want the gig, someone else will. Right. Yeah. Th those two behaviors I, I think are, are probably not uncommon. They may not be, they may not be absolute that that's sure. Yeah, I mean, they're clearly not going to be absolute, but I, 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 I think that those behaviors are things you encounter as your musician trying to bend. I mean, yeah. I get it. Bookers get called by a lot of guys, many people who are not qualified for what they're asking for, but your job is to figure out who is, isn't it? I would think so. Yeah. I mean, I, the only, I'm always someone and and this is probably, uh, you know, a, a, both a, a blessing and a curse f for me. I, I'm always looking for the, the reason why, right. I, I have this, this belief, I call it Chaffin's razor uh, because our friend, Brian Chaffin <laughs> was the one who introduced this concept to me that is very rarely does someone choose to act in a way that they would describe as irrational, right? You and I might describe it as irrational, but, but rarely would the person acting that way, they might, they have some reason, you know, unfounded as it might be or, or wrong as it might be, they believe that it's right. And so I often in these scenarios try and figure out, okay, if I was in that person's shoes, I know how they're acting. I know what I think I know the scenario they're in. So why would they choose to act that way? And this guy you described sounds like, especially the guy who won't return phone calls of people who have bands that like literally just want to give him money um, and, and, and like take responsibility for filling the place. Like you said, you know, with the house rockers to me that like one scenario is, well, I, I, I book you know, 10 different rooms or I've got 10 different things on my plate. It might be completely different from this, but I, you know, I don't have a lot of time to spend on any one of these things. I've already got something in there. That's like mildly profitable. I'm not losing money. 
I don't need to even answer those phone calls. The next six months are booked up. I'm good. Uh, in three months, I'm going to spend two days booking the following six months and, and then just put it on autopilot after that. Like I, like that is a scenario. I can't say that that's the one that mm -hmm. this guy's experiencing, but I always try to rationalize things. Like why would they choose to turn down a, you know, a per I mean, that's insanity to you and me. Like for you call up and say, I want to rent your room for the night. What's it cost? <laughs> right. Like that, that's a phone call that it would seem you would, you would want to return. I, I like you get to tell any price you want. Like you're the, <laughs> you, you didn't tell him I want to rent the room for $4. You said, I want right. to know what it costs. That's exactly right. So why wouldn't he want to tell you what it costs? Like, <laughs> I feel like there's, there's a win-win potential here anyway. People are crazy, man. People are nuts. People. They're yep. the worst. <laughs> yeah. They're the best and they're the worst. Yep. People scare me mostly. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's fine. It's fine. Life would be less interesting without everybody else. I don't know. We just keep the cool ones. I don't know. Would you know that would, if we just kept the cool ones, would we start picking them apart to like, what's what, what is human? What is our human nature going to do in a scenario like that? Like maybe it's better to just leave things as they are. I like the cool ones. I like the cool ones too, but, but we need, the only way we know they're the cool ones is because we've encountered the others, right? Like, mm. so that's what I'm saying. It's like, you got to have some of the, the yin Keep to fun. get the yang. I don't know, man. <sighs> Thanks for hanging out with us folks. I think, I don't think we're doing a show next week. Paul and I are going to see if we can make that work, but, but if not, we'll be back in July. It's going to be a little while because we've got some, uh, some travel here. So bear with us. We went a little long tonight. We, we added another level of deep thought. So send us your feedback at feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We're, we're, we're certainly able to respond to emails and we'll see on the socials and all that. I just don't know if we're going to be able to, put out an episode between now and uh, then, but otherwise it's, it's July 5th is when the next one's coming. Make sure to uh, tip your weight staff. I don't know what else. What, what do we say? What's the thing we're supposed to say, Paul? I always forget. A tip your weight staff would have been good, but always be performing. Please, That's... please, please, please. Even for weirdo bookers. Yeah. Always, always. Have a good one, folks. Later, Paul. <laughs> <laughs>